If you identify with having gone through childhood trauma and you're experiencing CPTSD symptoms, you're probably already familiar with the usual symptomology of things like depression and anxiety and body memories, which are like akin to flashbacks, um, things like irritability, numbness, isolation. And there's this is the usual list of stuff where we get that we when we do a quick Google search, and there's a general kind of good enough consensus about what these symptoms are. But as a childhood trauma therapist, I see that there's there's more to the usual, and those list of symptoms can sometimes leave you feeling confused or they're a little bit vague or they're not really connecting the dots. I'm Patrick. I'm a licensed clinical therapist, and I specialize in childhood trauma. I'm also a life coach. Welcome, welcome to the channel. If you like this video feel free to hit some buttons on the screen you really can't miss with any of the buttons the like button subscribe button share button and if you're interested in doing some childhood trauma work with one of the trained therapists on my team or if you're interested in joining a, a monthly healing community membership where you meet with me twice a month or if you're simply interested in doing some self-healing guided courses you just click this ball right up here it takes you right to my website and you can check out all those things that I just mentioned so diving right in here are three unnamed CPTSD symptoms related to childhood trauma that I see in my work that might give you some insight and in connecting more of those dots about how you present as a human in the world and how it relates to growing up in abuse and neglect. And also, I'm going to be discussing these from a standalone CPTSD diagnosis for, say, a neurotypical person. Neurodivergent people might experience some of these, but it could also be maybe potentially their baseline normal and not something that needs to be so like pathologized or something. So diving right in, number one is what I'm calling just simply perception problems. I think of this one as really as like my number one definitive issue about childhood trauma. I haven't had a client yet, including myself, who didn't struggle with perception problems. And we could simply define childhood trauma as abuse of perception in children and lack of connection with healthy caregivers. Problems of perception involves how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others, how we perceive the chain of events and situations in the present. And think of it as how we tend to make sense of things or find meaning in the present, but based upon what happened to you in your past, i.e. childhood. Here is what the problems of perception might look like. Things like reading a work email too quickly and reading it from your trauma narrative, and now the team hates you and you really mess this thing up, but then you go back to the email a few minutes later, 10 minutes later, and you read it and you realize that it wasn't even about you. Um, or even another one is you might go to a restaurant and hear laughter from a nearby table behind you and you sit down and your inner child feels like the laughter is about you somehow and you might even have an inner or outer reaction to that if, it's ha if you're having a bad day. Another is you, big one here is you get involved with romantic relationships or friendships and you miss red flags about the person and you don't pick up on toxic behavior. It's definitely related to the symptom number two, which we'll get to later. And another is misreading quick, subtle things. Like you go to a party, you see two people talking and your inner child reads them as being disinterested in you or turned off by you when they're engaged in a conversation. Another is being overly empathic when someone is in pain or distress stress and you perceive yourself as somehow being the cause of it or that you're now responsible to fix it for them. Lastly, it is consistently perceiving that you're unwelcome or excluded by groups. I know that I had this going on, excluded by society or school or work or even by strangers, that you're not up to snuff with the rest of the world. And to probably confuse you further, you might actually be excluded in, at work or something like that. I'm not saying all of these issues are just in our heads and not based in actual reality. It's more complicated than solely it being about our triggers, but it's not one or the other. I find that our system, like our trauma system, is also looking to confuse Firm that we're not safe. And it's like, see, I told you, I told you this would happen. But we don't know how to reclaim our perception and catch and confirm the ways that we actually are included. Both things can be true. You might even feel like dismissed by me in saying this and listing these things and just interpreting them as me criticizing you for having them going on and that's not my intentions. If you feel that, pay attention to both the second and third symptom and I'll 
I'll talk about that later in the video, so just hang in there. So why do we have such problems in getting ourselves or others or um, events possibly wrong or that we go to a big place in ways that overly protect us or kind of don't serve us anymore, to be honest. And I say this from experience because before treatment in my own childhood trauma, I was really reactive in romantic or relationships or friendships in those based relationships. I would read into behaviors incorrectly and become intense, which was destructive to those relationships. And all of that really made sense from the way that I grew up. My, my parents taught me to be highly reactive, highly guarded, highly disappointed in others. So abuse of perception happens when we don't grow up in a safe emotional home base provided by a sane person who has a good grip on reality. In fact, our whole development from say zero to 2021 um, in the abusive family system is essentially like one long gaslighting experience. And I think children are born emotionally intelligent and healthy engaged parents cultivate and develop that intelligence into raising hopefully like a well-adjusted, well-rounded, emotionally balanced human. And if you're like me, due to being gaslit about reality by growing up in toxicity, you're definitely gonna carry some biases into your adulthood, especially around what you perceive others to think of you. So you weren't wrong about how off it was growing up, but we have to look at the, con the quick conclusions we jump to in our adulthood. Here's how perception problems originate in childhood. As a kid, you might have had these kind of going on, where one parent had this like unsafe rage about them, um, and the other parent minimized that to the point that the rager's mood became normalized. Another is your parents didn't seem to really like each other or even enjoy each other, yet they kept plugging away at that marriage with each other. And raise your hand out there if you thought that a divorce might free them from that misery. And another is being a scapegoat or having a sibling that was like the better child. And the abuse of perception is being told that you're bad when the reality is that the abusive parent need a bad guy and a rescuer and a victim and that is a telltale sign of parental pathology and perceiving that you're only acceptable by being like a rock star child who can cook Thanksgiving dinner who can get straight A's who can master the violin and be a super mature little adult all by the age of 13 healthy parents just love their kids without performance being involved and allow them to be the age that they are when adults ignore consequences of abuse or dysfunction, it is to abuse a child's perception, like not being real about that raging parent. And I've had many clients who were sexually assaulted in their early or middle school or high school years to which they're blamed by parents for those events instead of helped. Why these things stick with us is because as kids, and the kicker here is I really want you to take this in, as children, we had to accept whatever the abusive parent's interpretation of reality was. And therefore, we lost our own innate sort of intuition in our compass and our gut reactions. To contradict myself a little bit, the other kicker is, is I think we have it a little bit in our teen years when we start to really see the abusive parent as kind of playing some kind of shell game. I remember calling the police on my father because he was, he was a physically and emotionally abusive parent. I think I was around the age of 13, and when the cop came to the door, that cop simply sided with my father and even joined in on shaming me for making the call. And the cop was just annoyed that he his time was wasted. No child or protective service paperwork, no real effort in reading the situation. Um, the condition of the house could have told him something. He couldn't give any more zero Fs about what was going on with this. Kids gradually accept that they have zero power in making their situation better and zero faith in the adults helping. It affects our perception of ourselves. So what to do about this perception problem? I think reclaiming our natural given perception um, is going to be about having sane people around us that we can bounce things off of. I had an excellent therapist who could ask me what I really think if I had a boss telling me that I was no good or notice when I was going into a trauma place about my girlfriend at the time. You know, and I then got into groups with healthier people who became like family and we did that for each other. Like, am I off here? Is this coming from my trauma or am I right about this? Um, there's lots of great inner child work to do about this 
but our inner adult has to buy into the idea that sometimes we'll get things twisted because due to our trauma. And sometimes you trust your gut and sometimes you don't. But having a healthy sounding board is really helpful, but don't pick a person who is just gonna like shame you <laughs> um, into thinking just like them. That is often a common trap for us. So if you're unclear on this symptom, think back to the times that you became reactive and jumped to conclusions and either messed up such friendships or relationships, or you became reactive due to reading something wrong and then went into a shame hole for having done so. There tends to be a cycle with this stuff with our shame and our trauma perceptions that isn't good for us. So the second unnamed symptom I'd like to talk about is directly related to the first and it's about basic innate human emotions. I'm calling this symptom a compromised emotional imbalance. Depending on the source that you choose, there are a range of say six to 10 basic human emotions that we're all born with. And you can look up Paul Ekman who identified six basic emotions as anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. You could also look up um, Paul Plutchik, who came up with four pairs in a similar way of polar opposites, joy to sadness, anger to fear, trust to distrust, surprise to anticipation. I like the following eight. Anger, things like fury, outrage, wrath. Um, sadness, things like grief, sorrow, gloom, melancholy. Uh, fear, things like anxiety, apprehension, nervousness. Joy, things like enjoyment, happiness, relief. Interest, things like acceptance, friendliness, and trust. Surprise, things like shock, astonishment, and amazement. Disgust, AKA dismell, that I'll discuss later. Things like disappointment and judgmental feelings. And the last one, shame, things like guilt, embarrassment, chagrin, remorse. Another good resource that I love is the book Homecoming by John Bradshaw. Um, I like his take on these and he discusses these primary innate human emotions around page 68. If you're familiar with a feeling wheel, you'll see some version of these basic emotions at the center of the wheel and then they fan out into more defined and nuanced nameable feelings. So now let's connect those innate feelings to trauma. In a similar video I did a while back on six unknown childhood trauma triggers, um, I, in one of those triggers, which was having someone be mad at you, I discussed in a hypothetical, I said something like, some children are raged at to the point that they might leave their bodies or that they leave their bodies. And many of you took interest in that. Something in that statement resonated with a lot of you. And it's relevant to this emotional imbalance symptom. Say a seven-year-old is raged at by an abusive parent, like a dysregulated adult, and that child will most likely go into the freeze response. Emotionally dysregulated adults are beyond what a child's nervous system can handle, like much less an adult too. So freezing um, is not just waiting for the storm to pass. It's not that just, just that experience. It's also a strategy of repressing or burying emotions such as shame, or fear or anger um, and then waiting for the storm to pass. I'm not saying it's like in a sequence, it all happens at once. Holding our breath, wanting to not exist, surfing huge feelings that we're trying to ignore in this kind of moment of being raged at. When a child does this, as a side note, our childhood trauma survivors, we all have our own version of these responses where we sever the innate basic emotions for now and we dissociate. The other four strategies like fight, flight, cry for help, submit, which is really fawning, also bury these innate basic human emotions. You know, this may already have been a pattern since the person's early toddlerhood if the adults are dysregulated and unsafe. You might also hear from me saying something like we're in our heads and we leave our bodies. Being in a childhood trauma strategy, fight, flight, freeze, all that stuff, is to be in our heads and leaving the emotional body where we're integrated in these basic emotions. So what does being in our head look like? Navigating people, fights in our head, ruminating, thinking about an emotional problem because we're unable to feel the emotion, analysis paralysis, replaying things, also related to the third symptom, symptom coming up. A telltale sign that you're in your head is if you go into a black and white thinking place. Like, like wait, I thought you said my perception is off, but if I let my guard down, a narcissist is gonna just come into my life again and wreck it. I hear that kind of thinking a lot, tells me they're 
in their head. And during development of, say, the 20 year span of a human development, you know, with unsafe caregivers, repressing and omitting feelings is kind of part of the game. They don't fully go away. We're just disconnected from them, and then it becomes habituated to not having those emotions serve us in a natural biological way. So the seven-year-old has to displace and disconnect from some emotions, such as fear, anger, surprise, shame, disgust. But, in a big but here, the kicker is, once we disconnect from one of our innate emotions, the others get compromised. A child growing up in violence and emotional abuse in the form of, say, a dysregulated parent will appropriately disconnect with anger or injustice or something like that. But they might grow up into an adult who doesn't feel disgust when they're being treated unfairly. They might later feel an exorbitant amount of shame which clouds their perception of people, places, and things and themselves. It would be really cool if all of us, the seven-year-old, could disconnect from the shame and fear and sadness, but hold on to the joy, hold on to the interest, or hold on to disgust. But it doesn't work like that. Let's look at a graph of what these emotions would look like in someone who is well-adjusted. Magical unicorns that they are, but they're out there. You've known some well-adjusted people and they tend to baffle us, to be honest, <laughs> as childhood trauma survivors. So this chart is super quick and kind of crude, but I wanted to give you a visual of what I mean. And a side note, the following graphs are done through the lens of a neurotypical person who grew up with an attuned and healthy parents. So there's no childhood CPTSD. They're human though. They are not perfect, but they got their needs met during during development and they don't carry other diagnoses such as bipolar or ASD or ADHD. The well-adjusted person's innate emotions hover at an ideal capacity in their life. What situations come up in their present life, they have an appropriate range and a reasonable amount of the emotion for the moment. When stuff comes up in this person's life, the emotions serve them at the appropriate time. And as a side note, the unicorn person's emotional experience will probably bum you out. And notice the numbers of reference of simply too much and too little, like the numbers on the left. Running down the list, they have an appropriate amount of shame and remorse for say mistakes. Say they're not really a drinker, but they had too much to drink at a party and they became sick in a bathroom and they needed an Uber home. They wake up with regret and an appropriate embarrassment, but they don't want to die from the shame or die from the, from the self-disgust. They can experience joy and spontaneity and excitement, and they can be fully present for celebrations. They can really dig into a vacation and de-stress, or they can feel fully ecstatic when they have a big win in life, like when they're buying a house or when they had a child. Surprise is a weird one. They can be pranked or scared without going to a big place of rage or sadness or disgust. They kind of might be pissed, but they can quickly find the humor in what just happened. Sadness, they can go through a breakup without becoming suicidal. They can be emotionally present for, say, a passing of a pet without totally shutting down or totally becoming dysregulated. I mean, it affects them, but not to the point that it affects their functioning. And with fear, they can be afraid of something like, say, a, lay a layoff, but they have faith that things will work out. The fear might be a pain in the ass or a financial hit, but not it being about that they were a worthless person without a job or that it's proof that they matter in life. So with anger, they have enough of it to tell somebody off while maintaining control, but not so much anger that they freak out others or toss and turn about, say, getting flipped off on the highway. Anger is a compass to them, but not a vibe that they might get stuck in for several days. And with interest, they can get sick of a career and make changes in, or, or kind of switch. They don't exist in a limited range of interest and can explore the world more. They are also more open to experiences and risk than, say, a childhood trauma survivor. And lastly, with disgust, disgust is probably like the MVP of emotions <laughs> as they really pertain to our worth and safety as childhood trauma survivors. The well-adjusted person can, you know, not only perceive and catch but they can be turned off by red flags with someone they're dating. You know, they're disgusted with how a date might treat the waiter or really turned off by someone's inauthenticity. Um, but they don't get down on themselves if they are judgmental about that poor behavior, which is actually a function of shame. 
Now let's look at another chart and you know, again, a kind of crude one, but to give you a visual on my ideas here. Here is an adult with CPTSD. Again, let's just call it a neurotypical client with CPTSD without any Corbid other kind of diagnoses. Notice the numbers on the left marking more and more of a deviation from the ideal capacity that we saw in the prior chart. There are four emotions here that are kind of off the chart in excess. Also notice the word hyper, meaning an excess of emotion and hypo, which is really having a deficit emotion um, in this case. Funny story here, when I worked in, in an inpatient locked acute psychiatry, like inpatient hospital, a psychiatrist that I had like a love-hate relationship said jokingly, well, Patrick, you're not hypo anything. <laughs> Meaning that, and this was very true of me back then, it's like working there, that I was super intense and super reacted. And it was just kind of a funny way for him to tell me that I had zero chill and he wasn't wrong. Folks who are in a hypo sort of state, they have too much chill. So the chart here reflects an individual with an abundance of shame, surprise, sadness, and fear, and a deficit, that hypo meaning of buried emotions of joy, anger, interest, and disgust. And those are in opaque because they're actually almost intangible to the survivor. Coming back to that seven-year-old who was raged at in the biological survival strategy of going into their head or the freeze response to wait for the storm to pass with the unsafe adult, affects all of these emotions which are thrown into an imbalance. And this occurs over time during our development through the abuse. Um, say the child then goes into their room and starts to hate themselves for causing the upset in the rageful parent, leading to an abundance of the shame feeling. That's actually the biggest takeaway here. And then they become so consumed with not making the same mistake again that they be become preoccupied with abundance of the fear emotion, along with the sadness emotion of believing that they are an unlovable kid who caused all of that adult burden and upset, and also the sadness of an abundance of being overly surprised or keyed up now around that dysregulated parent's mood. And you can see kids who have intense anxiety over basic mistakes as maybe something is going on for them at home where their reactivity or their surprise emotion is too high. It's not always childhood trauma, but it's a sign that something might be up for that child. So an excess or hyper amount of shame, surprise, sadness, and fear, and almost like a teeter-totter of the scale on the other end of the hypo-emotional state is buried joy because joy is not safe because it might upset the miserable parent if you're happy. Anger is gone because it's also not safe or even thought of with a dysregulated parent because the child is getting no mirroring or reality testing from a healthy parent or an adult who would say, you know what, your mom was really off there and not good to you. It's also to be angry at a dysregulated adult is just not physically safe. Interest gets muted as things like wanting to go to the museum as a kid or a field trip or making a mess by painting or having a friend over, it might set the parent off again. So being interested in things becomes potentially dangerous or could affect your environment. And disgust is gone because again, no one is helping the child with the reality that it's the parent who is off, not the child. Are children perfect angels? No. Is parenting sometime a pain in the ass? Sure is. Does having a parent with inconsistent mood or greatly dysregulated mood who shames children for just being children, does that cause problems in both perception and emotional balance later in life? Yes. This chart is just one presentation. Survivors can be any combination, and you can think of your own chart or even the chart of one of your parents. Anyone out there have a ragey parent who seemed totally cut off from their joy or their sadness? because it was all eclipsed by rage and shame. So what keeps a person stuck in this imbalance is I think unprocessed family of origin trauma, along with things that happen into like later throughout life. Getting into treatment, doing group work, interpersonal group work and experiential group work, like telling, I told my story through a genogram with safe people, I did anger work and grief work with safe people, um, and that gradually brought me back into balance emotionally. We have these compromised emotions because we have business to finish with our family 
family system. Our abuse in our family isn't done yet and we emotionally need our day in court about it. I don't think one can really do a quick hack or a journal entry to fix these imbalances. I recommend things like somatic therapy, EMDR, grief work or groove work aimed at childhood trauma work and it's, it's heavy lifting for a heavy problem. So the third symptom of what I'm calling is a vacuum relational experience. This one, I don't need a carpet vacuum or a dustbuster, <laughs> if they even make those still or call them that. I mean a vacuum, the absence of air in a defined space, such as say a bubble. On Earth, there is this atmosphere and there's gravity that keeps things grounded and connected. In space, an object is isolated and floats from lack of immediate connecting forces. Untethered, maybe a little bit lost. The relational part of this symptom is the idea of separateness that the childhood trauma survivor feels from others and from self during differences in emotional perceptive experiences. We experience disconnection by not being on the same page with others or even be on the same page with ourselves. What I'm describing here is a dissociative experience when our reality is questioned. So as a childhood trauma survivor, you might identify with the ideas that you feel isolated from others in the world. And remember, childhood trauma is really about abuse of perception along with disconnection from healthy caregivers. Here are some present examples about what I mean by this one. Years ago, you know, I would be so caught up in work at a job, I used to take things way too seriously Seriously, coming, coming back to that psychiatrist, um, and I took things way too seriously, probably due to shame or feeling unsupported at my job, resentment and anger. That was a usual vibe for me. And coworkers would be like, dude, like you're really intense right now. Are you aware of that? Like it's gonna be okay. And I'd go into this weird dissociative vacuum because I wasn't connected to my own intensity or the upset because it was showing up in my emotional outward affect but not on the inside. Affect is how people read us. I was disconnected from my feelings due to those first two symptoms that I mentioned, perception and my compromised emotions. I was perceiving work in an overly intense and unnecessary way, to be honest, and I was just caught up in the task in my head, but probably in some kind of emergency due to my trauma narrative, but disconnected from those emotions. Have you ever been told that you're way too serious or too intense, yet in your mind you're just getting through your day or getting through the holidays or whatever and it's like brand news to you? Have you ever been told the opposite, where you're so calm and you're so chill, but you're literally on fire on the inside? I was untethered from myself and also how people experienced me. Um, it's triggering to hear that you're coming across as intense or that you're chill when you're not on the inside. You might even have been like me at the time, defensively thinking, intense? Mofo, you haven't seen intense yet. <laughs> um, you don't even want to, I'm on three. You want to see me on 10? As a side note, you know, this vacuum thing can also happen if someone is being manipulative. You know, I was being intense, but you could also have the same vacuum response when someone tries to tell you your sketch when you're not. Am I sketch? Did I embezzle all that money? I don't think I did. Like we don't, we're not trusting our reality. Another example that causes this relational vacuum is different takes on people. Let's just say when, when I waited tables, I often talk about that. There was a, say a new restaurant manager, um, which would be the authoritative person that the servers would either feel supported by or they, they would like become their arch nemesis. There wasn't a lot of in between in that kind of line of work. So let's say myself and another server started sharing our first impressions of this said new restaurant manager. If I perceived a new manager as say fake and a bully or dismissive or flat out lame, let's just say that the other server found them to be funny and easy and just a lovely person. I would then experience that untethered feeling again and I would get triggered by that different experience that the other server had. And I was now without the gravity and connection to the server as well as connection to the correct perception of the manager. We weren't on the same page now all of a sudden, so I thought. And that same was true in the inverse. Sometimes that I would be friendly with the server or a line cook that turned out to be a pretty kind of toxic character and I would totally miss it. And then I would get freaked out and go into that vacuum when some were reported that, you know, Joe the Fry guy stole something from their apartment when they were all partying that night. Vacuum relational experiences are akin to what it feels like to be gaslit. 
I'm not saying you are being gaslit, I'm just saying it feels that way. So you might be asking, you know, so, so who was right, Patrick, about the restaurant manager? I'm super glad you asked. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They could have been a garbage person or they could have been an angel. It's really about how we have this symptom that makes us dissociate when others don't experience the world like we do or when people give us feedback about our emotions that are brand new to us. So it can feel like a betrayal from others or a betrayal of yourself, a betrayal of your reality. You know, say you're newly married and in the first couple years of your marriage and you're getting to know your in-laws. Your partner who is not psych-minded and has hasn't needed to explore therapy, but you come from a highly toxic family and you're engaged in the healing stuff, you're all about looking at the trauma stuff, cool, cool, but you're starting to experience your mother-in-law or your father-in-law as having like major red flags concerning narcissism. You visit them over the holidays and a four-day visit at their place is like a low-key nightmare of passive-aggressive, weird, underground conflict and your partner is totally aloof or doesn't see any of it or doesn't really want to get engaged in it, you know? So you start to free float, losing gravity and feeling like you're in a vacuum again. That is akin to your childhood trauma where abusive behavior was just normalized, like no big deal. Let's say that the in-laws are factually narcissist and difficult. The symptom of losing one's reality and going into that relational vacuum is present. Let's say that they're not factually narcissistic, but they're just like quirky or difficult or tricky. Same thing. The symptom of losing one's reality and going into the relational vacuum thing is present. So the in-laws can be narcissistic or they can be just difficult, but in context, the kicker is in context of the partner feeling not supported by the partner or not validated by the partner or it's like the, the part not having the partner sign off on our experience is to really be triggered back to our family of origin trauma notice how this symptom we don't trust our reality but we need someone to confirm what we're feeling and what we're thinking that's what this vacuum thing is all about so remember earlier when i said that sometimes our abusive childhoods are just one long gaslighting experience this is what conditions us to go into these specific dissociative vacuums. Some examples from childhood. You know, mom says that she's finally gonna leave the abusive boyfriend after you pleading with her for like a year. The big day comes to kick him out and then she, oops, she actually made up with him. They're gonna live happily ever after now because blah, 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 blah. Then she pretends like she never had such conversations with you. The situation is more common than you might sort of think. Do you think a child or a teen would feel untethered from reality? You know, betrayed about not being on the same page. In a weirdly specific example from my own childhood is sometimes my mother would do nothing but rage and complain about my father, that he was garbage and he ruined our lives and how his children were right to really hate him. Much of that was actually valid, but not how she discussed it or how she handled it or um, didn't protect us from it. Then she'd sometimes try to get my father and I to do father-son things together way after it was clear that the relationship was like irreparable. And I would get untethered from reality when she would try to do that. Like, wait, I thought you said he ruined our lives and how he was abusive and now you want us to spend a day together and go into town. You know, I was like, what, you know? And maybe some of you were say scapegoated and had more valuable siblings and things like your graduation or your birthday got canceled over super minor or made up offenses. And the sibling gets all the attention that day, all because you asked a question or you didn't clean a dish right. This is like mommy dearest type stuff. In all of these examples, there's big disconnections over reality. And this symptom of going into that dissociative place often has a vibe like that. We're like, wait, what? Where are we? You know, things like, I thought my partner, we'd share reality on other people. Or I thought my friend, we'd agree on whoever is good and whoever is bad. Or the vacuum relational symptom is just a sign that it's telling you something. It's telling you that you're triggered. And I'm just suggesting that we shouldn't need such confirmation as much as we do. Like that's the inner child piece. So say with the restaurant manager, I didn't quite know that friends could experience others different from me. Say with the partner with the in-laws, you don't have to lose your truth or your perceptions by having your partner not sign off on them. 
And the reverse is true. Like, see, like in your vacuum response as a trigger, and you can explore that, maybe you're not 100% on the in-laws. Your body is telling you that you're in danger, but is it 100% right on that one? I'm not saying you're right or you're wrong. I'm suggesting to explore the trigger, which actually helps us figure this out. If we can get the childhood trauma piece off the table, we might be able to say clearly in the present. So the vacuum symptom can resolve itself. Um, once both the inner adult and the inner child feel more secure within themselves and there's more integration. Like not being on the same page with others isn't so dangerous anymore. So some final thoughts. Let's go through the three interconnected symptoms. Perception. <clears throat> our symptoms around perception problems make it tricky for us to trust our gut or not. Sometimes we trust it and sometimes we don't. But my main suggestion is to have a healthy sounding board, friends, a therapist, so you can work on and kind of reclaim a sense of our gut or reclaim a sense of our perception um, and kind of fix the things that don't serve us anymore about perception. The second piece is compromised emotional imbalance. Directly related to either being right or wrong, say about the in-laws, due to your childhood trauma, you may have a hyper amount amount of fear or anger or shame or joy, disgust or hyper amount of something and a hypo amount of other things of say joy, interest and surprise. So I'm not saying it's always going to come out that way. When we have compromised emotional imbalance, it's like this, it, that's a fuel that confirms our perceptions. Like whether that's the in-laws or narcissists or the manager is a terrible person or you're a bad pet owner because you've been emotionally distant from your pet for a couple of days. The third thing is the vacuum relational experiences. Um, when we're not on the same page with others, we can lose our gravity and feel like we're being gaslit again. Um, while validation and confirmation are something that we kind of all need to be honest, it can't be like that all the time. And sometimes people disagree with us. Sometimes you're right about the in-laws sometimes you're wrong about the, the manager, but the paradox is, is it doesn't fully matter about the present so much. Going into the vacuum is telling you that you're going through a family of origin trigger about your perception or your compromised emotions that need to be healed due to the unprocessed trauma that you were carrying. So if you are really interested in this video, I might be releasing a more of an extended version of it to go into more detail about the symptoms. So I hope this video was helpful to you. Check out the resources on my website that I listed. Leave a comment, ask questions. You're safe to disagree with me. Would love to hear from you. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be joyous. Take care and I will see you all next time.